Hello. Welcome everybody to all participants. Welcome to the invited speakers. We are very grateful that you made your, your time available to share with us um, your thoughts on this uh, very uh, interesting and relevant topic to companies, governments and uh, institutions. We expect to have a bit less than an hour of an informal conversation, right? Where we can interrupt each other and we will talk about this uh, topic on who will lead the industry 4.0 in terms of economic blocks, or maybe um, come to a conclusion that in this time, the, this type of revolution will bind us more than will divide the economic blocks. That could be an interesting question. Before uh, I start, give uh, context to, to, the, to the participants uh, whom we welcome. Um, they can, the participants can pose questions in the question and answers or even use the chat to share their ideas with all the others. Uh, what motivates us to this topic? The fourth industrial revolution uh, is truly global and promises to bring an era of economic prosperity after this pandemic is, is overcome. Uh, it is expected that a golden era like in the 20s will, will start and it will be very much supported by technological advancement taking into consideration all that has been happening even before the pandemic. So it is very natural that each economic block, it's doing the utmost to fast track uh, the development of the technologies of the business models that will bring more well-being to their citizens. Uh, to discuss what challenges are involved, we have three uh, speakers who have complementary uh, perspectives. I will ask each of them to introduce uh, themselves uh, before we start, starting with Martin, going then to Sherry, and then to, to Christian. Martin, most welcome. Thank you so much, Carlos, and, and thank you for having me. Um, so my name is Martin Tanto. I'm the managing partner at Blicity Ventures. Uh, Blicity Ventures is a, is a pledge fund. We focus specifically on European startups that want to expand to the US. We have a, about a hundred plus investor network and work with these investors on a, on a deal by deal basis. Uh, my background is uh, I'm originally from Germany. So you're going to get the little bit the German US perspective here. I've been living for about 15 years in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been a startup founder. That's actually how I, I got here, but also worked for an IoT platform provider in Europe for a while. Other background is uh, been a management consultant with Booz and Company, Oliver Wyman, and also worked for companies like Deutsche Telekom. Great, Martin. Most welcome. Sharing. Yes, thank you for uh, having me. Um, so my name is Sherry Lee. I'm based in uh, uh, also in the Bay Area in uh, San Francisco. Um, so I work for G Digital. Um, so San Ramon is actually the headquarter of, uh, of G Digital. And G Digital is a business that's basically the digital arm of General Electric Company. Um, and what we do is basically transform um, the way um, how industry solve the toughest problems by putting the industrial data to work. Um, I've, um, I've spent, I would say, half of my career in, uh, in Asia, in China, in Singapore, and half of my career in the U.S., and I've spent um, some brief time in, uh, working in Paris in, uh, in, in, you know, in Europe as well. Um, so you know, this is a really interesting topic. I met uh, Torben uh, uh, during a trip that he led a group of um, really, you know, key executives uh, from Europe and, and you know, for a tour in San Francisco in the, uh, in the kind of the Silicon Valley for, um, for innovation. And when he asked, I said, yeah, definitely great to you know, meet the group of people at the community for LBC. 
I look forward to today's um, interaction. Um, I would also say that, you know, um, just, you know, because of the, uh, my work background and you know, I might have some, you know, personal views around the adoption of IoT, but I wouldn't be able to represent GE Digital Trio. So just a little disclaimer there. Uh, look forward to the discussion. Mm -hmm. All right, Sherry, thank you very much. Uh, yes, definitely the views of the speakers are their views and not of the institutions they represent. Christian, welcome. Yeah, Carlos, thank you for having me. I'm very glad to be part of this uh, webinar and I'm looking forward to uh, yeah, sharing with you my view on Industry 4.0. I'm heading the Industry 4.0 Maturity Center a managing partner there. The center is based uh, in Aachen, Germany. So I'm taking the European part here. And we are mostly working with multinationals and we're helping them in the transition to data-driven organizations. So we have a strong focus on manufacturers, which are globally active. And um, yeah, this is what I'd like to share during the next uh, 60 minutes with you. Okay, most welcome, Christian. Then I'll, I'll pass in this order Maybe we can keep the order, but we, you can intervene and, and uh, pick up on each other's uh, views if you want freely. And I pass a very broad uh, question is that given the particularities of each economic block, what should they be doing uh, to, to uh, spur the advancement of the fourth industrial revolution? And associated with this question is this uh, idea that uh, China is, is a leader in production, Europe is a leader in engineering, and the US a leader in digital. Is this correct, or was it more correct in the past than it will be in the future? Martin? Well, I'll, yeah, I'll jump in then. Um, thanks, Carlos. Um, well, uh, I think it's a very broad question, of course, right? Uh, I don't think anybody has the answer to this. My short answer is it's not correct anymore, maybe, uh, and it will not be in the future. But let me go a little one step deeper before we develop this question further on in the call. First of all, I want to say, um, and Sher, correct me if, uh, if I'm wrong how you see it, but the term Industry 4.0 is not really a term that we're using in the US. Um, it's more a term that is, uh, exists in Europe. I think, uh, correct me if I'm German wrong. German origin, yeah. yeah. Germany led the, coined it, yes, yeah. Yeah, and uh, don't, don't understand me correctly. I think it's a good, it's a good term. Uh, it's a little bit of a marketing term it's a little bit of a term that brings a lot of underlying technologies together. And that, that's totally fine. I just wanna say, it's not something, if you, if you ask somebody in Silicon Valley and their opinion about Industry 4.0, they might not know what you're talking about. Just, just as, a, as a quick uh, disclaimer. Um, I think this um, statement that you did on you know, Europe uh, leading in engineering and, and US and digital, I think this is a little bit overcome. Um, I would believe that the, that, that the US still has a, a pretty good lead on the digital side. However, as we're seeing, China is catching up tremendously to it on this point. Um, and if we're saying, um, Europe is, is leading in engineering. Well, as far as I know, is, uh, China is producing more engineers than the US and, and Europe together. Are they all bad? No, of course they're not all bad. Um, they just haven't you know, been rolling in their, um, in, in their jobs yet and uh, China's taken the lead on that. So I think this is overcome. Um, but before I go too much into details here, I also want my, my other panelists to speak, and then maybe we go uh, one, one level deeper. Jerry? Yeah, I'll, I'll, yeah I would Thanks, definitely man. concur, uh, Martin. Uh, thank you for the, for the great thoughts there. Um, you know, I, I think when we think about Industrial 4.0, when we hear about digital transformation, when we hear about you know, IoT applications, um, really they're kind of the means to get to something. And we really have to kind of think about what is it that we're getting to. Um, so, you know, it could be the business results that we're getting to. It could be 
um, you know, there could be kind of really drivers behind um, all of the, kind of the adoption and, um, and um, a really, you know, thinking about, um, you know, kind of the level of maturity for all of these different concepts. I fully agree it's actually a concept or, you know, probably kind of a, a terminology that was coined to put together a lot of technologies because really, if you look at the technology stack, um, it requires a lot of um, uh, maturity level at different levels. So, you know, the driver could be, um, you know, economical driver, it could be business driver, it could be emotional driver, it could be social drivers. Um, it, it's really, um, I want to say that we have to look at the outcome of uh, the adoption of all of these um, you know, different uh, concepts or, you know, or technologies. Uh, really kind of that will get us to the bottom of why we're, you know, we're doing this um, instead of, you know, just, hey, you know, we're going to apply this um, to certain things and for the sake of applying it. Um, I would just probably give two examples in, the term, in terms of just the, the, different, the differences between the regions. And I would say that the answer to the question is probably it's a little bit oversimplified, um, at least, you know, for now, I'm kind of putting into the context of, um, of, this, um, of this topic. One example is if you look at um, you know the factories in uh, um, let's say you know in Silicon Valley, in, in, which is traditionally people might view that this is not a kind of production you know base for a lot of enterprises, and um, also it's pretty expensive, right? But if you look at you know Tesla, say for example, their factory in Fremont, it's highly automated. Um, and then another example that I would give is. Um, if you kind of, you know, think about, hey, you know, I kind of associate China or, you know, some of the, you know, Asian countries that kind of, kind of, as kind of production base. Um, but I would also say that outside of the kind of the, uh, supply chain or production uh, industry, because really we got to look at um, a lot of different industries. And it's really, if we think about the region, it's really as a whole. Um, one example would be, um, or, you know, I guess this is one of the advantages um, for, you know, some of the countries who relatively have newer infrastructures. And when I say infrastructure, I mean, not only just kind of the, you know, the, really the, the construction, you know, the road build kind of infrastructure, but also the IT infrastructure, the digital infrastructure. That's actually a, a advantage for them because they have relatively less legacy. Um, legacy meaning not only the system they have to change when they implement certain applications, but also the processes and the culture that they have to, you know, to change. So, you know, examples like, um, I think, you know, probably a lot of people who know a little bit about Asia and China would be knowing that um, uh, one of the you know, kind of the payment methods there um, is, is very interesting. If you look at mm -hmm. kind of the phases of how US went through, hey, right now we're still kind of predominated for credit card transactions. But over there, it's a lot of, you know, this, you know, mobile payments, um, you can really use your, sure. you know, the facial recognition. So it, it's just amazing to watch uh, countries and regions where relatively they have newer infrastructure to do the leapfrog to the next level of technology. So just two examples there for, for the, you know, for, for us to all think about that question. Great. Thanks, Sherry. Christian, do you want to add? Yeah, of course. So, so probably let me let me uh, start with the term industry 4.0 because I think this is a, is a it's a good remark. Yeah? It is a term that was coined about ten years ago uh, in, in Germany, and uh, of course it it had no, uh, has not been adopted uh, in the U.S. and in China. So th those uh, countries have their own programs. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, strong ties to, to the government when coining these terms. And, um, but let me share my understanding of industry for the overview. The, the, of course, it's connected to manufacturing, but the point that I think is relevant that is that it's not limited to the shop floor. Yeah? So when, when, at least when I talk about industry 4.0, uh, it's, it's much more about the entire manufacturing organization in a sense that the idea behind industry 4.0 is learning from data, you know, wherever these data arise and, and what you make out of it. So, and that's the reason why for me, it's not only important to the shop floor, but also to other processes and parts of an organization. Now, um, yeah, the question uh, who's leading in that field is of course very different, uh, difficult to answer. So what I see uh, when, when I talk to companies in Europe and also to, to friends over the, in the US and China, then I would say, especially in the early days of industry 4.0 or digital transformation, whatever you may call it, uh, people started with what they uh, think is familiar to them. Yeah? So, and when you look at, for example, the S, um, 
you have a lot of investment uh, capital, especially in the Bay, Bay Area. So working on new business models and on, on startups is rather easy. So when you compare that to, to the German landscape, we have a lot of small and medium-sized enterprises. Yeah? So family be uh, businesses uh, who are in a niche, yeah? who, are, who are probably global leaders, but nobody knows them and they, they do, yeah, they make great products, especially in the B2B sector. And um, of course, when those companies deal with industry for the old, they are not thinking about uh, uh, probably new business models in the first place, because probably up to now, these business models are still working. They are still intact. So what they deal with is improving the classical KPIs of a manufacturing organization, their yeah? quality, uh, production costs, logistics, and so on. So, and this is probably the, 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 uh, first differentiation I would make, yeah, the, the way uh, we perceive the, the opportunities that come with digital transformation and um, industry for the world, they are probably a little bit different across the world. But um, of course, this is more and more changing. Yeah, we see the, the big platforms um, arising in China and in the US. Um, and of course, um, this is something where uh, we want to be part of. Yeah, and we and, and um, manufacturers in, in Europe try to finance us to that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's adopt then here the, the term coined by the World Economic Forum, uh, the fourth industrial revolution. It's probably more transversal to, to everybody. Uh, picking, picking from what you said, the three of you, in the past, these industrial, the first, the second, and the third, were very much associated with some geopolitical dominance, right? Um, uh, England, then the US, et cetera, et cetera. Is, is this fourth industrial revolution of a different nature that it is more global and less geographically um, isolated than in the past. I've got here a question from one of the, of the participants that if you see that after the pandemic, there will be more of a collaborative effort across all countries or, or not, what will be the tendency because of this interdependency that um, a global revolution brings. Um, not going too much into geopolitics, but into the nature of the technological um, framework we're dealing with. Does it bring more interdependence or does it allow that each will, will run on its own in a leadership path with the others uh, very much on a second base? Well, I mean, if, if I may jump in, um, I think we're having a completely different situation today in terms of globalization than what we had in definitely the, the first and the second industrial revolution. Um, this is unprecedented. And even that the last couple of years in the US, uh, you might say, have seen some downside in globalization, but in other nations as well who focus themselves a little bit back more on the block, I think that the general, that the, the, the general globalization is not going to halt here. I think it's going to develop further. And that, of course, means that um, the fourth industrial in, uh, revolution is going to be much more dependent on the other blocks. Um, I actually think that in the end, it's, uh, it really depends on the, the, the actual companies in each blocks and on the adoption of, uh, of IOT or in, in industrial IOT technologies for these companies to actually um, lead the companies, lead the industries and lead, lead the block in, in the end. But I think there's not going to be such a limitation anymore as maybe what we have, uh, maybe what we have seen before. China opened up a lot. Um, I've just read that um, China has surpassed the US now in foreign direct investments. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, saying that, you know, China's a completely closed market where nobody can invest, 
I'm sorry, mm -hmm. it's not true anymore. Yeah. Uh, it's even surpassing the US. Um, and that we have definitely not seen 10 or 20 years ago. Yes, definitely. That's the news of the week. I'm glad that you brought it up because that is really a, a landmark. Uh, Sherry and Kristen, would you like to, to comment? We see um, one of the pointers that Martin uh, brought is that it's going to be more companies than governments or industrial policy that will have an impact. Nevertheless, uh, uh, let me mention that Europe as a whole, European Union, and each country has got a very strong uh, industrial policy framework with lots of money on research, on incentives, on technolo technological development, AI, and all that. China has got also a very similar industrial policy framework with trillions on, on that. The United States, I was just reading here as I was talking, that they also have a document that's called Industry 4.0 Market and Technologies, Focus on the US 2018-23. So um, all of them have industrial policies that are very centralized in terms of the push. But Martin here uh, sets here a challenge. It, is that going to be very efficient or progress, economic progress led by technology will depend more on companies and company adoptions and all of those drivers, business drivers that Sherry mentioned? Want me to answer? Yeah, I think. No, it was for Sherry, but you can, you can compliment no, no, okay. Martin. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. That's why. Sherry, go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I, I would say, you know, kind of when I when I uh, when I heard that question, uh, callers, and, and really love the point that you mentioned about Martin, that the investment uh, from you know from China and a lot of different uh, you know countries are really you know really improving and catching up. Um, I would say, you know, if you think about kind of the the future landscape, uh, my perspective is um, um, it's going to be definitely more interdependent compared to the previous. A rounds of you know revolution and it's going to be there it, there will be a lot of more a lot more collaboration than before from really from three perspectives and we kind of started with the production with the supply chain and we all know that the global supply chain i mean it, you know right now there might be a trend that it you know we're trying to be more independent inside of the regions but the, the global supply chain landscape wouldn't change overnight um and you know we might be you know when i think about kind of the if you zoom out and think about the bigger cycle, we might be in this upward spiral, if you will. So, you know, in the last um, couple of decades, it's been a, a trend of global, you know, kind of um, a globalization, and now there might be more globalization. Uh, but eventually, it's going to be more globalization. So, um, we're definitely going to go on this path um, for sure. So, supply chain-wise, it's going to be interdependent. Um, and then the other thing, you know, Martin really mentioned about this global businesses, and I really think this is a very, very good point, um, because if you think about the, um, uh, you know, whether that's the adoption for um, IoT applications, whether that's the transformation of, you know, supply chain, whether, what, you know, whatever that is, the global businesses will, will play a really key role here. And if you think about, hey, if you're investing in a new factory in different region, it's probably not going to look a lot different than the factories in other regions, for example. Um, and then also thinking about how people manage the global, um, you know, let's say uh, from a manufacturing perspective, um, global supply chain, how they, how they will standardize the business processes, how they will, um, you know, standardize kind of the technology adoption. That's going to be very similar. So that's the second, um, a second um, uh, perspective. And then the third one is really technology. I think technology compared to the previous rounds of revolution the speed of technology um, advancement and then the speed of technology collaboration um, are, are much faster than previous. So eventually, if we think about, um, you know, all the great technologies that's been invented in the past, um, it's just going to be open to you know, all of us in a much faster fashion. So really, you know, kind of interconnected supply chain, global business driving, you know, kind of the standardization of how we manage um, the different aspects, you know, business and technology wise, and then um, faster technology is advancement. It will make the you know the next round um, much more. Um, I, I would say a more kind of interconnected world than before. Great view. I concur with that. Christian, would you like to add? 
Yeah, sure. So uh, I would ag agree with the other two speakers that uh, yeah, the world is much more globalized than it probably was like 20 years ago. And um, probably uh, with, with industrial IoT around the, the corner, uh, manufacturing itself is not the key differentiator anymore. Yeah? Be because companies are globalized, you have global supply chains, and, uh, and as a global organization, you choose a best of breed approach. Yeah? So you, you will you will you will choose the best environment for you and that is probably not any more um uh, linked to, to 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 the to for example whether you're producing in a high wage or a low wage country yeah this, this is something that will vanish but what we'll see much more in the future is the differentiation of products yeah so individualization uh, sustainability those are the things that are um coming up now, up now and I think that that um, the fourth industrial revolution will play a key role here. Okay, very interesting because we we read on the politician side all of this need to create redundancy, redundancy and uh, in terms of supply chains, etc. But the perspective that I'm here from people that actually working with technolo technological development in the economy, in the economy with companies and startups, is that we should be much more pragmatic and uh, go with the flow of uh, focusing on efficiency, interdependency, collaboration, rather than other things that might uh, be disadvantage for everybody in terms of a geopolitical um, perspective. So given that, uh, given your perspective then, uh, let's focus on companies, what executives should be doing then, if large companies, if SMEs should be leading the way and will be the determinant, what are the priorities that uh, company executives uh, should be focused on? That is the first question. And then the second question is which, which technologies, obviously it's, it's a broad question, but which technologies will be really revolutionary? And here I bring uh, 5G and artificial intelligence. So let's start with the first one on what is the priority? Where do you start? Or if you have started, where should you put a lot of your investment to really make a change and take advantage competitively of this new uh, fourth economic revolution? If you are a business executive, Martin, can we follow the same uh, order? Absolutely, happy to. Okay. But you can also change the order, you know. I'm All right. Makes it that. easy. Okay. But, um, I'll jump in. Um, so... Good question. And question I really like is, um, uh, and especially also to to the people listening here who, um, from what I've seen, you know, work for manufacturing companies who, um, where IoT is really, um, or industrial IoT is really a, a big topic. I think um, we are definitely talking about adoption of industrial IoT. Uh, what does this mean? And how can I get ahead in the curve here? I think it's really relevant to not look at the, at the, the, the final solution of, an, of an, a fully integrated IoT stack, but really think about what I have also been doing in the last five to 10 years in terms of adoption of technologies that have been already there and where do I have gaps here? And what I mean with that is that I do have an... ERP solution or an MES solution, if I'm a manufacturing company or supply chain company, is hopefully already a given. Um, but we have seen more and more technologies that have been introduced that are part of this wider industrial IoT stack that I really need to uh, that I really need to look into and build my vision of a fully integrated uh, industrial IoT stack. Um, so what I want to say is uh, it is important to adopt or to look at my organization and see which technologies are relevant for my industry and which of these technologies should I be adopting and implementing right now and what, what is my future vision uh, of that IoT stack. And if companies have not been 
doing that so far, then I think it is it is definitely time to do that um, to to lead in this uh, to lead in this game. Be, before I pass on, Martin, where, where are companies coming short on that path? Talking to startups or innovation model, is there is there a model they should? pick up and say, this is the model, this is the pathway. Um, because we talk about disruption, disruption and technological disruption, I think that, um, and transition and transformation, those are all aggressive terms, right? And sometimes uh, executives get a bit uh, confused on so much things that are disruptive, transformative, um, how can we make it simple for them? We... Yeah, I mean, I think this is, uh, uh, it, it would be nice to have a simple answer here, right? Um, we, in, in, in Europe, um, we talk a lot about digitalization. Uh, interestingly enough, and sorry that I'm focusing too much on terms here, but I'm not hearing this term too much in, in the United States. Um, it's kind of a given. It might or, or also have a little bit to do that here based in the Valley, we're all talking about digital companies. So digitalization is not really a topic because that's the company that you are. Um, but of course, for manufacturing companies, that is relevant. Um, I think um, you were asking about how do we make it easy and also which technologies um, I believe are relevant. Um, uh, I think from like I said, some technologies should be a given that I have a, a mostly a digitized um, manufacturing or digitized company as a whole should be a given. I think the big new thing that uh, that is coming up and that we're seeing also, especially here in the Valley, is AI. Um, to, 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 to mention the term here uh, again, and I'm picking it up from, from you, Carlos, of course, that you mentioned it, I think it is the big term here. I think it will have a tremendous effect um, for, for nearly all companies in the future. Um, and although we are still very much in the beginning of AI and especially in seeing the benefits of AI, right now it's mainly a, a capex that I'm, I'm putting in and, and an investment that I'm putting in without seeing that many benefits yet. Um, but it will be the future. And I think today is, um, is the time to look into which AI technologies are, are relevant for me. How can I implement them? And also what are the business models and what is the value? What do I wanna do with AI? Um, what's, what's the output gonna be? What is gonna be better than if I would not have used AI? And if I can answer these questions, then I think I'm on, I'm on a good path to implementing that technology. And for me, and AI is either part of industry 4.0 or it's a, an, an aside um, term. It, it doesn't really matter here. I need to look into both of them. All right, Martin, thanks very much. Sherry, with your experience at uh, General Electrical Digital, I believe that you have something to add here. Um, could you also focus on where do you find that companies are coming short or executives when they taking decisions? Where are they coming short? Yeah, um, absolutely, Carlos. That's a that's a great question. And um, uh, maybe I'll just you know pick on a couple of things that Martin said uh, as well. But let me first kind of address that point. I think the key thing when we think about um, you know digital transformation or digitalization, whatever that you know kind of um, the thing that we are trying to um, get to, uh, the most important thing is the business outcome. Uh, that's the um, I would say that's you know the kind of the most um, uh, important factor that we have to focus on. And, um, and really getting into the um, uh, kind of the business results and, and, and really before that is the business problem. So what is the problem that you're trying to solve? That's the most you know, important thing. When we, when we think about all, you know, all of the, the pilots or the investment that people are making, the business case should come first instead of thinking about, hey, I'm gonna you know, yeah. adopt technology for the sure. adoption. Yeah. So really mm -hmm. thinking about what is the business problem? What is the outcome that we're trying to, to, you know, to, um, to get to? And then I want to pick on, you know, kind of point that um, 
uh, Martin mentioned just now, which is a technology stack. If we overgeneralize all of the IoT applications um, uh, or you know, kind of um, the, I think the digital applications or digital solutions, um, it's, it's really about getting information from the assets or from the physical world. Um, so you're using some kind of sensors and getting the data and store the data, um, analyze the data, uh, going through some common foundations, whether that's security, that's UI, all of the common components, and then get to the outcomes. And the outcomes would be some kind of insights or some kind of action uh, recommendation for, you know, for the users or for the, um, for the business. So if we think about that you know, kind of technology stack, now the most important thing, of course, like I said, is you know, the, the outcome. But at the same time, when, you, you know, when we think about, hey, um, I'm going to solve this business problem, it would be very important to look at the different technology options and, um, and of course, you know, making sure that we have the, the architecture to get to the data that you really need. Uh, one of the challenges that we hear a lot from, you know, just the customers and, you know, the, the companies that I've been working with is really, you know, their insights are, hey, we, you know, we adopt this technology, but at the end, when we try to get to that business outcome, we realize that it's not, we're not really getting the right data. So really thinking about um, the business problem and then the business processes that needs to be transformed, you know, to the point that Martin mentioned, hey, you have this ERP, you have this MES, but it's really that business process that matters. So it's not about kind of the digital thread, if you will, not the information flow, but more about the business um, <clears throat> processes. Um, the other thing that I won't touch too much deeper on is the culture piece, um, the change management. People sometimes might resist to change, uh, especially for industries and where we have a lot of, lot of you know, kind of domain expertise. Um, and um, really how you think about, you know, driving kind of the behavior and the culture change to adopt the new solutions that will change the way that they work is also very important. Okay, uh, sure. Sherry, I'm, I'm glad you, you brought that point on the business outcomes. Um, uh, in my experience, I see that a lot of decision makers, executives get uh, distracted by technology. And uh, they overspend uh, in, in order to reach a business outcome that is uh, sometimes much easier to achieve than, uh, than the way they took. Also that point of um, change management. Really technology, when one thinks of technology, thinks of hard power, right? And soft power needs to be the still, the leadership, the resistance to, to change, the adoption models, etc., the gains for everybody, uh, the impacts on the organizations. So I'm really very much aligned with that. Christian, would you like to, to add on this? Because you, yeah. you guys are, as I believe, are specialists on assessments and roadmaps and things like that. Right. So first of all, uh, I mean, what I have to say is I'm, I'm quite happy that uh, digital evasion industry for it all, uh, digital transformation is now a topic to executives there. So if, if you compare that uh, to, to like uh, five to 10 years ago, that probably was not the case. Yeah. So that is very important to us because it gives us the chance to make significant investments into digital, which probably have not been made a couple of years ago. Now, um, my view on this is that um, um, the business case is very uh, crucial. And, and the, quiz, the question is, where do you find value? So you mentioned ERP systems already. This is something that you can scale rather easily in a global organization, yeah? because uh, processes like procurement, uh, HR, so they, they are nearly the same. Yeah? So this is an approach that works globally. Um, talking about manufacturing execution systems, it's getting much more complicated already because uh, at least multinationals um, have grown a lot via mergers and acquisitions. And what I can tell you about the uh, basis is that it, uh, yeah, it might be the case that it looks different uh, in each and every plant. Yeah? So uh, the US uh, working with different technologies uh, than, than, than other plants. Yeah? And um, this is of course a, a challenge uh, when you're trying to capture data that is coming out of the equipment. Yeah? So running a, a global MES project can be really uh, challenging. However, these, um, now when we start talking about AI, uh, 
ERP and MES are still the low hanging fruits yeah, because they help you to uh, improve key performance indicators uh, like uh, quality, uh, cost and so on. Um, um, so AI is definitely a big thing, but, but the question is where do you look here? Yeah? So uh, from the perspective of an OEM, AI might be a very good opportunity to monetize the data you have uh, at the interface to the customer. Uh, when you want to monetize AI internally, for example, in a, in a production process, uh, then I have seen some cases that are um, rather challenging yeah, because the, usually the, the problems you try to solve with AI are rather hard yeah, and they might uh, change a lot. Yeah? So, so the AI solution, at least for now, probably that's changing in the future, need to be really customized for the problem you are uh, trying to solve. Yeah? Um, from my perspective, uh, to just share with you where I think where we are standing is we, we did a study on that a couple of uh, months ago. And what we see is that 80% of the manufacturers uh, talking about scaling are still in a phase where they implement business and IT alignment. Yeah? So they are adopting ERP on a global level. Yeah? It's not the case that they had, didn't have those ERP systems in place, but now they are consolidating it. Yeah? With MES, they are a little bit behind and the, the IT platforms that we see nowadays is something that is just emerging. Yeah? So we, we have those uh, strategies given on the global level, on the strategy level, but now in the next step, it will be uh, the task to connect different plants to that and really make sure that you capture real-time data out of your equipment, out of your assets in a global platform. Thank you. Um, we're coming to an end. We've got less than 15 minutes to, to go. I'd like to, to bring in the question of startups and the size of companies. Um, we're seeing big tech dominating. We're seeing also efforts in the US to uh, confront the um, overload in terms of power that some of these uh, big techs have. Um, arguing that they are not a, a force for economic progress, but uh, in terms of innovation, uh, that is a challenge. On the other hand, we've got startups and Martin deals with a lot of startups. I see that this world of um, the interface between uh, large companies, established companies and startups is probably very well done in Silicon Valley, but in Europe, in Europe is, is a bit of a, a challenge still. How open innovation can uh, help companies to, to progress faster? Uh, in China, I don't know what the situation is, but this ecosystem, how, how do you see the ecosystem of startups, large companies, established companies, traditional, more digital, uh, digital natives entering the companies? How, how do you see the balance of this ecosystem? I, I find that sometimes uh, startups have got a lot of innovation to bring that can accelerate, but they have got a difficulty in getting into uh, doing business and getting investment from established companies that could benefit a lot from uh, this open innovation approach. Uh, on the other hand, I see that some models of the startups, once they start being integrated into established business, sometimes they lose their competitive advantage because they work in an in a assumption uh, that starts to be eroded once they start being integrated into a, an established business. Moving forward and trying to accelerate uh, the path of companies and of uh, existing business to accelerate and focus on business outcomes, how, how relevant is this balance with, uh, with startups and uh, new companies emerging? Martin, do you, would you like to start? Sure. Um, these were many questions, Carlos. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's... <laughs> no, no, no. Oh, I'm Portuguese, you know, Portuguese are usually very complex. You know, they bring the whole uh, 
uh, all assumptions into the question, right? You pick up whatever you want. I really yeah, no, think no, that no. open innovation is an issue in a lot of companies, to make it simple. How can they deal with it? That's that's fine. And I mean, yes, that's true. That's 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 what I'm dealing with every day. And um, uh, I mean, f for me, the U.S. has a pretty healthy environment, let's say, for startups to emerge. Um, uh, I mean, if uh, now we have the pandemic, but leave the pandemic aside, right? If um, usually you go on the street in, in San Francisco or anywhere in the Bay Area, you know, everybody kind of is doing a startup. Um, but the question here is a little bit, um, what's the value out of it and how do larger companies also benefit from that? And how do we create innovation as such? Um, my general term is any company uh, uh, that's not a startup needs to embrace startups, needs to embrace innovation. Um, they don't need to see that as a threat. They should see that as an opportunity to gain because these startups they want to be acquired. Uh, these startups, they want to do a cooperation. These startups want to sell their products to companies. Um, and I think companies should be open to that. That I think is one of the key success stories that we're having in the US, that companies generally are more open to startups. If um, I'm a startup and I have founded a few startups and you know I've been on the telephone myself and if I'm if I'm having a product and uh, uh, you know I want to sell this uh, I want to sell my new product and nobody's ever heard about me people have usually an open ear um, uh, at least you know give me a trial let me let me let me test what, whatever you have right and then if I don't like it then you know I, I don't like it but maybe it's an interesting thing and I think um, there in what what I've seen in Europe because I've 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 tried the same in in Europe and uh, it has been definitely more difficult there. So I think there is something that um, Europe can can learn from the U.S. and I don't want to say the U.S. is better than Europe, not at all. And I'm gonna go into maybe just a, a side on where I think the Europe uh, Europe uh, has has strength as well. But that is that is definitely something. Um, maybe the whole world can can learn from the U.S. The U.S. has has done very well with that. How do corporates do this? Well, um, uh, many ha many have their M and A um, departments. Many have corporate VCs set up. I mean, there are many ways of then kind of doing that on the ground. Um, I know a ton of um, kind of um, outliers from companies around the world in Silicon Valley that have people here looking for startups, looking for innovation. Um, but I mean, it's important to do that, not just in Silicon Valley. I mean, we have the whole world to be, to be picked up, you know, be in Israel, be, be, in, be in Asia, be in Europe for American uh, companies as well. And I think that's very important in this globalized world, not to kind of, um, you know, just look, look on yourself, but be careful that you are aware of new innovation, new startups in your vertical, because they might have better business model, better ideas, better ways of doing things, and you don't want to miss that, right? Um, and um, for for Europe, because I think we also have a lot of um, uh, viewers from, from Europe, um, I think um, I mean, I'm European, I'm German originally, and I think um, uh, uh, Europe has uh, a lot of advantages. This is what you also started with. And I think one of them is really the pluralism um, that we have in Europe. Um, we have tons of different uh, languages. We have tons of different opinions. And I think that's a good thing. And that I think uh, also sets them co uh, completely apart from China, if you think about it one main language at least, you know, Mandarin and then many other side languages, but one main language that everybody speaks and a relatively um, homogeneous thinking that, that is coming also from for, for political reasons. But in, in Europe, there's, uh, it's, there's tons of it. And I think people need to embrace also that 
diversity that, that Europe has, these new ideas that Europe has, um, and that is actually a good thing. Um, sometimes overlooked maybe in Europe. My two cents. Martin, thank you very much. I was just reading here a question. I think that we still have time to, to fit in if we have short, short answers, which is um, one of the great challenges of uh, industrial uh, companies is sustainability linked to climate change. And will this be a, a game changer uh, in terms of the use of technology, uh, climate change and CO, CO emissions, or it's going to be more of a rhetoric that, uh, that will not have much application. Will, will companies will uh, really have to transform in order to address the problem of, of climate change? And will technology be an ally on, on, on that? Um, Shira, I don't know if you want to answer this one or the previous one on open innovation, because I know that you also have a lot of experience there. Yeah, I would just quickly touch upon the point that Martin mentioned uh, about the startups. I, I, I think I want to underscore the word collaboration here. I, I cannot be emphasized more. Um, it, it's really about, you know, that kind of from a big corporation perspective, um, the startup speed um, and um, it is really, you know, something that um, that's very important from the, for the you know, big corporations to adopt new technologies. Definitely, I would say, um, you know, tr find ways to, uh, to kind of take advantage of the uh, speed to value, you know, the, the flexibility for the startup community. There are tons of really smart people out there and, um, and really it, it takes kind of a village to really understand sometimes the value of a new technology. Um, and then the collaboration will really, you know, speed that up. Um, so I think that's, that's one thing. And then from a startup perspective, um, also take advantage of the opportunity when you, you know, kind of cooperate with um, a big corporation, you know, their requirements um, will really help uh, up level the maturity. Um, and then sometimes the kind of, you know, I think we touch upon interoperability, um, uh, you know, to the, the big corporate, you know, corporate environment, if you will. So I, I would say collaboration will definitely foster the, um, um, you know, much more business outcome that we talked about. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a great topic. Um, the, the, the other question, which is this, you know, kind of the, this um, decarbonization, uh, that's one of the trends that we see, in, of course, in, the, in a lot of different areas and especially the utility industry that we play in. Um, I would say that's kind of the, if you think about the three drivers that I mentioned earlier, the business driver, the emotional driver, sometimes it's pride, and then the social driver. And that's definitely the social driver. So the, the answer to that is definitely yes. Um, the, um, uh, you know, the social impact that um, this, you know, the CO2 emission has on all, all of us uh, will definitely uh, be considered as an important factor for new technology adoption. So, you know, if you think about just in the area that we play in, the, you know, all of the renewables uh, coming onto the grid, and that requires tons of new technology solutions to cope with that. There are tons of challenges that, you know, we kind of, I mean, as, um, as normal consumers of electricity, we don't, we really take it for granted that I, if I turn the switch on and there should be, you know, there should be light, but it takes a lot of complex um, technology solutions to really get to that. Um, so I would definitely that say that's a strong yes. And it's, um, it has to do with the social driver for the technology adoption. Sherry, thank you very much. Christian, uh, on these two questions, open innovation and yeah. climate change. The yeah, so, so, so to, to add something to the first question, of course, I, I agree with Martin and Cherry. Um, if you're interested uh, in this, there's a term called ambidexterity, and uh, it means handling uh, exploration and exploitation at the same time in terms of business models. And the, from, from the perspective of a corporate, uh, startups are an ideal partner to work on the exploration aspect. Yeah? So helping them to, to continuously look into new fields of business. And the corporate has, of course, the strengths in um, um, exploiting those businesses, yeah? helping them to, to, to make it grow and uh, make it part of, uh, of, of their core business yeah? uh, in, in the long run. So startups and uh, manufacturers or corporates go together at the winning team yeah? and, and that's definitely something that we need to get in our heads. Now on the sustainability aspect, um, um, I would say that there's no way around it yeah? and, and we definitely should embrace it because at least in the long run, these resources are limited. Yeah? And if you look at countries who are highly um, 
uh, redundant or highly looking into into um, oils, for example, they are changing um, the business businesses dramatically in their company in, in their country. Yeah? And this will definitely be the future. And, and what I see in, in companies is that this nowadays already plays a very crucial role. Yes. Yeah? So so definitely sustainability will be the answer. The question uh, is on the adoption rate. And this is something um, yeah, where, where I find it hard today to find an answer. Okay, thank you. We've got two minutes. And I'm going to ask you for a quick question of guesswork. We all read reports and the reports get outdated uh, one week later, two days later, some of these reports uh, on the recovering recovery from the pandemic, right? The speed of recovery of the pandemic. And sometimes it's more relevant to have a hunch, to have an intuition of experts. Um, what's your feeling on the, on the start of a strong recovery, economic recovery, uh, worldwide or in each of the three blocks? Uh, is it possible to have a short answer on that without much justification? going on a gut feeling from all that you read and your sense of the future yeah i mean i think um we're gonna be we're gonna be out of this um uh, starting this summer towards uh, towards fall um of, of of 2020 um we've seen that china had um had a lead on this in the sense of uh that they had even a growing economy last year. Um, congratulations. Two percent or something, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Two yeah, percent growth, I think. Right. Yeah. Where where definitely Europe and, and the US were were losing several percent. Um, but uh, from what I've seen, um, uh, what you know, catastrophes or you know, even the pandemic uh, that we had like a hundred years ago, we were all not born. Um, but from, from what you read there is after a pandemic, there's a very strong back turn in um, all the businesses, all the travel or the purchases that haven't been done and were not able to be done during that time gets done afterwards. So I'm, I'm expecting um, some, some, some good uh, backlog of, of business that wants to be done. And that's going to happen in, in 2021 and 2022. Okay, so you said after summer, you say September, you'll see, you expect things to pick up more strongly? Yes, um, that means, of course, for 2021, you still, if you, if you look, if the economists are going to look at 2021, you, you're still not going to have the, the full recovery in yet, right? Because okay. we're, we're in this mm -hmm. still right now, and it's already 2021. Okay. So but I would say from Q3, Q4, you're going to have this recovery and then definitely also next year. Okay. Sherry, what's your guess? Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm very optimistic in this. I think we're going to conquer this you know, pandemic and we're going to go through the, the challenges one way or another. Um, I, um, I definitely think that um, 2020, we've been handed a lot of lemons, but I think 2021 will be a year of lemonade. <laughs> um, and I think we should really take advantage of the fact that from a digital transformation perspective, we definitely see that um, we, uh, uh, the, you know, the pandemic has actually advanced the um, the speed of adoption for a lot of dig digital solutions. So it's it's a great thing for digital transformation. Okay. So let's all uh, look forward to the new year. <laughs> an added an added question on that: Will it be a K uh, shape uh, recovery where some sectors will recover much faster and others will lag behind for a while? Or is it the same? You think that one will feed on the others? I think one will feed on the others. Um, we're thinking about the driver from consumers and other industries. So I think I, I think it's going to be still interconnected. Okay. Thank you, Christian. What's your feeling? Yeah, I'm, so I'm optimistic as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that uh, later this year we will uh, start the the recovery. Um, however, it will take probably uh, up to probably two to three years till we are on the on the level that we've been before the pandemic 
Um, the positive thing from, from my point of view is that we are in it together. Yes, yeah? so everybody is facing this situation. And uh, since we talked a lot about collaboration during, during the last hour, I think this is something that, that will really help us in the, in the future. Yeah? So uh, yeah, brings right. people closer together, yeah? although we All can't right. but I, I, physically. Right, but I sense that for you is going to be a slower, a, sl a bit slower, the, the, the recovery. Did I sense well what you said? Yeah, it could. Be. I mean, um, for for the for the eco economy as a whole, I, um, I would uh, assume that it takes rather two to three years to fully recover than only one okay. year. Yeah. All right. So we are three minutes over. Um, I think it's you know listening to from experts, uh, things take a, a different value, right? So listening from Martin, who is very experienced with uh, innovation and, and startups. And if you need uh, assistance there, uh, guidance in terms of innovation, linking up open innovation investments and all that, I'm sure that will be available. Listening from Sherry, who has got experience from uh, General Electric, digital new products and uh, large companies and large projects, also uh, has got a different value than listening to people who has got much less, less experience. So I'm sure that there you also find a door where you can find some help. If you are a large company and you need some solutions, uh, you can contact Sherry. And uh, Christian uh, also is very experienced with assessments and uh, road mapping in terms of making it easy for companies. So um having these words from you uh, has got a great value because you are very experienced. Let, let me try and, and summarize some, some takeaways uh, that I got from you. Um, one is this question on collaborative supply chains. Uh, this geopolitical talk of one block against the other uh, might not resist the pragma pragmatism of business and the need of more collaboration that this fourth industrial revolution brings. And uh, you were talking, I was looking for some information here. The European Chamber of Commerce in China found that only about 11% of its members were considering relocating out of China. And uh, we had also in the US, I think it was 8% to 6% of the companies. Uh, so I think that this is a very pragmatic view of people uh, who are dealing with, uh, with business that give us this very um, perspective on collaborative supply chains. The second one is on the technology stack, that it's overwhelming, but it, may, it is easier if one focuses on business outcomes and goes on to strategy, competitive advantages, and things like that and uh, goes on to uh, low hanging fruit and uh, does not get too distracted by, by technology itself and sees it as a means. And seeing the com compounding, the business driver, the social driver, the emotional driver. And that brings us to the third takeaway that I think that Sherry uh, highlighted uh, is about change management about the soft power that one needs. Now, technology is hard, hard thought. The, the fourth is, is the need to monetize and um, do not um, have an investment plan that where you, you do not monetize early. So you need to have a pathway to start getting uh, results early. The fifth takeaway I have is about open innovation. The, the effort to, to be more agile and add speed to value, uh, value through, through open innovation and, and startups. The, not the final one, because I've added an extra one after that, is really the key here is collaborative models, working in ecosystems. The fourth industrial revolution is not about a competitive company. It's about a competitive ecosystem. If you are building an isolated factory, you know, just going to the shop floor, which is easier now, 
uh, you're not going to succeed. Uh, you really have to be integrated with other, uh, with your ecosystem in terms of data and uh, especially in terms of data. Uh, so collaboration is really the key and working in the ecosystem. And finally, I bring what one of the uh, participants uh, brought into the, into the panel, discussion panel, it's about climate change. That climate change will be a driver for changes in companies rather than just a, a rhetoric. It will really have an impact. So um, I hope I have, with these seven takeaways, in a way, reinforced the value that you've added onto this uh, into this uh, webinar. Thank you very much to the speakers. Thank you for the participants, and we see you in the next webinar. This is our third. Uh, you're most welcome for the fourth, and we will send a, a short summary to all uh, participants on on these takeaways and also on some summary information on this theme about the three blocks. Thank you, for everybody, and keep safe. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos.